I'd like to start with the human race's most powerful technology, bar none. Um, this technology uh, is something that nothing else since the Industrial Revolution can even get close to for its sophistication, its subtlety, and its world-changing potential. It's also about the third technology we ever came up with. Right after chipping flakes off flints, and right after setting fire to little piles of wood, it's something we came up with at least at the end of the last ice age, possibly a bit before. It's this one. <laughs> Turning those into those sorts of things, and all the other versions of that that we've done. This allows people with no education whatsoever to manipulate matter at the molecular scale. People who think that the sun goes round the earth can do this satisfactorily. You can explain how to do it to people who are eight years old, and they can do it. And of course, you need some extremely expensive and high technology equipment to achieve it. Uh, this advanced genetic engineering equipment here. Um, perhaps a few pens if you're doing it with animals, or the instruments in a potting shed if you're doing it with plants. And we'll come on to see how we're going to unite this with conventional engineering technology in a minute. But having started on a biological theme, let me just continue with it for a little while. Um, something we all learned about at school is the biological phenomenon of symbiosis. And perhaps the most famous symbiosis of all, uh, the one that we're usually given as our first demonstration of this phenomenon, is that between the insects and the flowering plants. This evolved about 140 million years ago in the late Jurassic and has been going from strength to strength ever since. And we all know how it works. The plants produce nectar, uh, which they use to reward insects that visit them. And the insects transfer the plant's pollen to other plants because the plants can't move and the insects can. And both parties to this arrangement are happy. They both get something out of it. Of course, human beings take part in symbioses. Uh, here are a couple of our symbiotic species. Well, I say symbiosis. Really, this relationship is a little bit more like slavery in many senses, unfortunately. Um, one of the species uh, that's involved in these symbioses toils night and day to clear vast tracts of land for the benefit of the other species. Um, that land is then completely uh, kept free of predators, of competing species. Um, we even take the children of this species every autumn and store them away most carefully so that they can get a head start in the next spring. And all the other species has to do is sit there and grow. So it's a very, very unequal relationship. Um, chickens, we have a symbiotic relationship with them. Chickens, um, they can't run, they can't fly, and they taste good. That's usually a recipe for evolutionary disaster. Um, but um, chickens are actually, evolutionarily, in terms of numbers, the most successful bird that has ever existed. There are 15 billion chickens on Earth. And the reason for that is purely because they have a symbiotic relationship with the most powerful organism that has ever lived. So. There's actually a pretty close parallel here with the nectar given by the plants and the insects to the insects to help them reproduce. Here, uh, eggs and flour make cake, and we get the cake in exchange for the reproduction. Now, I said earlier on that breeding is our most powerful technology, and it's something, of course, that predates the Industrial Revolution by thousands of years. And in doing that, I was rather dissing all engineering products. Let me now recant slightly from that position and say that quite a bit of our engineering technology is pretty neat. How can we go about combining these ideas with engineering technology in order to make something that retains the power of all of them? Well, suppose we make a machine that was capable of manufacturing, self-replicating in other words, almost all its own parts. Not quite all of them. We'll come to that exceptions in a minute. And that it was designed to exist symbiotically with people, and it will give them goods in return for being helped to replicate. In other words, it'll behave like the flowers with us in the role of the insects, the goods taking the role of the nectar. Um, that brings me to the RepRap project, which is short for the Replicating Rapid Prototyper. It is indeed the machine over there, which Andrew pointed at when he introduced me. Um, now, just a few words about rapid prototyping. Um, this is a technology that's now 20, 25 years old. Um, many of you will know about it already, and so I apologize for giving you an explanation of something you understand. Um, 
But for those who don't, uh, it's three-dimensional printing, or sometimes called fabbing, short for fabricating. Um, and the particular type of this technology, there are many different varieties, variations on this, but the particular type that I want to uh, talk about now uh, is basically a computer-controlled glue gun. What you do is you have a spool of plastic, the red filament in the left-hand picture. You feed that into a heated chamber, and you squirt it out of a small nozzle. And then you have a flat plate. And with that nozzle, you scribble on the flat plate to make a layer of a three-dimensional object you want to make. You then drop the plate down by a fraction of a millimeter, lay down the next layer, lay down the next layer, repeat that process, and you end up building something like, well, there's a jigsaw on the right, but you can build a wide variety of different plastic objects using that, that particular process. Now, if we're going to make one of these machines and have it reproduce itself, clearly we need to look at which bits and pieces that go into the machine uh, the machine itself can manufacture. And let's start with the most difficult bit, um, this is the right head of our machine, um, and basically everything you can see there that's white, the machine is capable of making for itself. Now you'll notice that not everything the machine makes. There are some added in bits, uh, there's a $4 electric motor at the top there and some nuts and bolts. We made a decision right at the beginning of this project that the machine wasn't going to be able to make every last part of itself, but that everything that we brought in from outside had to have two properties. It had to be very, very simple and cheap to obtain, and it had to be available everywhere, all over the world, to everybody. Almost anybody, no matter how poor they are, can afford a few nuts and bolts. And the robot that was in, is on the stage there is the other part of the machine. Um, once again, appearances are deceptive. Uh, most of the stuff you can see there is fairly cheap. Uh, the wooden platform, for example, is made out of MDF, which is the stuff they make kitchen units out of, so you can just buy it in a hardware stock shop. Um, the rods are threaded rods, again, hardware shop. But it looks as though most of the machine consists of that and not very much rapid prototype parts. In fact, about 60% of the parts in that machine are parts that it can make itself. Well, obvious question is, does it work? Um, this is uh, a test bed machine, not quite this design, one that we built earlier. Um, and we used it uh, to manufacture the right head that you saw before. This is it. And this is the right head that the machine itself made. Now, that machine there, as you can see, looks as if it was made in a garage. Uh, there are two reasons for this. Uh, the first reason is that it was made in a garage. Um, <laughs> by one of the New Zealand guys working on the team. And the other reason is that if everybody is going to be able to use this technology, then it's got to be possible to build it in a garage. Uh, at the bottom are the component parts of the plastic extrude head. And top on the left-hand side is an extrude head. It's got a heat shroud around it, which is a bit of old drink bottle. Uh, is an extrude head made in a commercial rapid prototyping machine. These cost perhaps $50,000 up to half a million dollars, depending on what type of one you get. And on the right-hand side is the one that I just weighed around, just starting to work for itself. Uh, and that was made by the right head on the left. Right head on the left, curious juxtaposition of words, but you know what I mean. OK. Well, this is an academic research project. 99.923% um, of academic research projects, that statistic is accurate, never get anywhere. Um, <laughs> Let's just indulge in a little bit of hubris for a moment and ask the question, what will happen if the replicating rapid prototyper takes off? Well, let's give it a start. We're going to start by making it open source. We're not going to charge people for this in any way at all. And there were two reasons for deciding to do this, uh, just in the same way, incidentally, as software like Linux and the Firefox web browser and so on is open source, a concept I'm sure with which you're all familiar. Um, two reasons, as I say, for doing this. Uh, a sort of high moral, rather pompous reason, really, and a very low practical one. Uh, the, the high moral reason is that it seemed to me when I started that this was potentially a very powerful technology, and that a good way to make bad things happen with a powerful technology is to divide people into people who have it and people who don't and have to pay for it. Now, all right, I'd be in the first group, but even so, that seemed to me to be a bad idea. And the only way to prevent that happening is to give it to everybody. Second reason, the low practical reason, is that if you have a machine that can copy itself, you can't sell it. You only ever sell one. <laughs> now, 
Let's suppose that you want to make a straightforward plastic object with which we're all familiar and for, with which some of you at least have use, for which some of you have a use, and that's a comb. Um, traditionally, if you want to make a comb, what you do is you go out and spend an enormous num sum of money on an injection molding machine, and then you have some dyes made, and plastic is injected into those dyes, and this machine makes co I mean, it can make 10,000 combs an hour. Boy, can it make combs. Um, or indeed, any other plastic object. Now, suppose in contrast that you have one of these machines, and it takes an entire day to reproduce itself. And in that day, it's got just enough spare time to make one pathetic little comb. How long before the reproducing machines overtake the machine making 10,000 combs an hour? The answer is, and it won't surprise you because you all know the power of an exponential growth, 18 days. And after a month, there's a machine for every man, woman, and child on the planet. Now, <laughs> of course, that's not going to happen for the same reason that we're not up to our necks in rabbits. Uh, there's not enough grass. Um, anything that reproduces is capable of exponential growth, and that exponential growth is always checked by resource limitations sooner or later. Nonetheless, it has the potential, when things are available, to expand very, very fast indeed. Anything that copies itself inevitably becomes subject to Darwin's law of evolution, and this is no exception. Um, and in particular, of course, because it's a machine that's manufacturing its own parts, the designs of those parts have to be available with the machine, and those designs are rather like the genotype of an organism, and the machine itself is rather like the phenotype. But it won't be evolving primarily by random mutation in the way that biological organisms evolve, uh, evolve, it'll be like the breeding process, and here we return to it, that I showed you in the first slide, because people will be deliberately changing the design of the machine to improve it. And of course, some of those improvements, not necessarily all, uh, will be posted back on the web, so other people can then take advantage of those improvements. And note in particular that if you have an old, early design machine, and it's a few years have gone past, and better designs have been posted on the web, then you can download the latest designs, have your old machine make you the latest machine. So we've got artificial selection working here, the breeding process, and people will obviously use this to improve the machine in terms of its speed, uh, making it simpler to put together. At the moment, you have to be a sort of tech, tech geek to put it together, but uh, we hope that that will improve, uh, make it more accurate. Fewer added in parts, those electric motors and so on, they had to come in from outside. Economics, doesn't matter how much the first one costs, all the rest costs raw materials plus assembly time, which means that the lower your labor costs are, the more advantage you have with this technology. Um, once you have one, you can have any number. As I mentioned before, you can't make money by selling the machine. It has the potential to create wealth, but you can't actually make money with the machine itself. Well, people will probably find a way to make money on the side of distributing it, just as they have with open source software, but its main progression is not really dependent upon the flow of money. And our target cost for the very first machine, for all the bits and pieces and the raw materials you have to put into it, is $400, which is not expensive, but uh, it's not cheap either. On the other hand, when you think the cheapest commercial machines cost $30,000, $50,000, then that's quite an improvement. Perhaps more importantly, we're shifting the material that we use even before the machine moves out into the world. Uh, we started with a polymer plastic called polycaprolactone, which is a biodegradable polymer. Um, but we want to shift to polylactic acid. Um, and we've already started doing that. Um, the reason we want to do that is because you can make polylactic acid by fermenting starch. And what that means is that if you've got a two, 10 or 20 square meters of ground, uh, you can grow your own starch crop and then not only have you got a machine that can copy itself, uh, you've also got the possibility of a self-replicating supply of the raw materials as well. And in fact, this little flask is our first ever polylactic acid object that we made in the machine. And if you think about it, what this does, because the machine is self-replicating, is that it allows manufacturing to come to the world's poorest people because they don't need an enormous investment in their community to get one of these machines up and running. And what's more, they can use local resources in order to fuel it and get it to make things. And indeed, unsurprisingly perhaps, because agriculture is purely concerned with objects that copy themselves, 
It makes the whole of manufacturing much more like agriculture. Finally, the question of recycling the things that the machine makes. Polylactic acid is biodegradable. If you make something in your machine from polylactic acid that you've grown in your immediate vicinity, um, all you do when that object breaks or you get tired of it is to throw it on your compost heap. Six months later, you dig it back into the soil, and it's growing your next crop of corn or potatoes. And that means that you've got an entirely local production route with no need for trucks going around conveying stuff from A to B. What of the future? Well, I said this was hubris. Maybe this won't happen. But maybe we'll get a 10th gener generation replicator in every home. And the implication of that is the need for fewer factories making stuff, the need for fewer trucks transporting goods around the place, possibly even less need for money. It'd be interesting to try and make a dent in the entire concept of money. OK. Self-replication allows exponential growth, as we've seen. It allows customization effectively by selective breeding. People redesign the machine, and the most successful machines will, of course, be the ones that prosper. And it allows very low cost. This idea of selective breeding is something that we've all come across before. Indeed, as we've already uh, had indicated today, there are far too many people in the world who go hungry. However, um, the proportion of, that, of the human race that are going hungry is reducing a little bit every time. There'd be people in this room who would be hungry if our ancestors hadn't turned the object on the left into the object on the right. I'd like to finish with a quotation from the writer Ian M. Banks. Um, money is a sign of poverty, he said, by which he meant that in any civilization, uh, if it needs money in order to regulate the disposition of goods, then it is necessarily an impoverished society. Um, the idea behind this is that we should be able to create goods for ourselves uh, without necessarily the intervention of a great deal of financial activity at all. If you're interested, the website is on the screen there. And that's all I have to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Adrian.